Right, good morning guys. Uh, apologies for keeping you waiting there. Uh, we just had a little bit of um, a little bit of crystal collapse stuff to discuss with Max. So I'm going to be doing a bit of play testing with him tomorrow morning. <coughs> um, but we were just setting up some uh, file sharing so that we can both get the oops breaking stuff up here, so we can get access to um, all of the stuff we need. So let me just uh, first things first. Go get some music on. I'm going to stream until about two o'clock this afternoon. Um, <clears throat> and uh, hopefully, by the time I finish the stream today, I'll have the remaining two bandits ready. So we've got three melee bandits, we've got two shooty bandits. So I've got to add one more shooty bandit and then one more elven bandit. I, honestly, I want to do t I want to do two more elves because I've got three and three and three. Um, but I feel like that many elves in a group is a bit overkill. So I think I'm going to rein it back. I'm just going to stick with just the two. Okay, so let's get the uh, let's get stuck straight in. So I need a. Human female. <coughs> so we'll start with this one. Your symmetry's on for this first bit. Morning, Oleg. How are you doing? Let's have a little gander then. <coughs> <coughs> so, Oleg, what's the what is the purpose of your your work? Is it uh, are you making miniatures? Are you doing digital art? <coughs> I mean, what I can see, it all, all looks really good actually. To be fair. Your Pokemon characters are all nicely exaggerated. They all look like they will. Uh, let me just pull this down onto the screen, actually, so you see. So your Pokemon characters here, these guys look pretty good. Um, you look like you've got a decent amount of exaggeration and uh, <coughs> kind of increased depth and whatnot. On uh, let me just pop on more extreme actually. On the details, so that they'll show up in the 3D prints. So they look good. Mushroom guy looks cool. Um, again, if he's 3D printing him, I would suggest maybe make sure the like the string on the necklace, the bag straps and everything else are thick enough that they're going to print okay. So ideally you want them to be probably no less than about a millimetre thick. Um, I, otherwise, if like things like the necklace, you just make, make sure you extrude it back into the body. <coughs> so there's no resin, there's no gaps underneath. Excuse me, I think hay fever is getting to the back of my throat today. Okay. Um, <coughs> Colouring is lovely on this guy, by the mushroom guy, by the way. Uh, this guy looks good as well. <coughs> so, uh, again, in terms of printability, he looks good. Um, I would suggest probably that some of the details might be a bit superficial for smaller size models. If you're doing him as a 75mm or larger, he'll be perfect. Um, if you're doing 32mm, 
the hair strands here are possibly going to be a little bit problematic you're going to have to probably extrude them back into the head to make sure they're not like free hanging bits that can break off um, and some of the little details here like the little ribbings and the uh, grooves in the, the vest um, and some of this like intricate work you've got here it's all lovely work um, but again you're probably going to need to make the the ridges a bit more pronounced uh, make the deeper bits deeper make the higher bits higher just to create that little bit of contrast um, but I would also say get Get them, get them printed and paint them. Print them and paint them, um, and you'll you'll see it for yourself. Then you'll you'll see the uh, the issues. Painting will open up your eyes uh, to, and I'm not talking digital painting by the way. I'm talking like actual physical painting. Skeletons are looking great. Well, you got a good mix there of uh, practical and skeletal looking. Arms possibly a bit thin. Again, your arm your arm looks about as thick as the arrow. Um, you may need to thicken up the the bones on the upper arm a touch because um, that's going to be a, a real weak point. That's going to be verging on too thin to print. I'd say double the thickness there. Double that. Double the thickness of the arm. The upper arm. Um, And the last dude, I mean, he looks like a unit, he does, he's cool. I like him. Nothing wrong with him. This little seam line won't show in a print. And this texture here is possibly a bit too superficial, and you may need to just enhance that and boost it up a touch. <coughs> but otherwise, he'd be great to paint. Very cool. Good work, Alec. Very nice work. And so if you're a beginner, just keep up doing what you're doing. I've got no uh, no photo reference here, so this could be disastrous. But Thank you, Olo. I say, you feel free to jump in and uh, ask questions anytime you like. I'm glad you found some of them useful. If you're on the um, Discord chat, uh, if, if, in fact, I don't, know if, I don't know if you are on the Discord server, but let me just uh, get the bonker. You beat me to it. Thank you, sir. Hope you're doing well today, matey. There you go, Oleg. If you use the uh, use the Discord server there, you can pop in. You can come and share your work. Um, Post stuff up in any of the channels, join in the chats and discussions and stuff. And if you if you want any direct feedback from me at any point and you don't catch me on stream, you can always just pipe, pipe up in there. Um, and I'm always happy to have a little look. <laughs> no worries, mate. It's a good day to hang washing out today. It's like uh, the same for you as it is for me. It's always nice to get a bit of feedback. Let, him, let me know I've, uh, I've helped. Give 
me a warm fuzzy feeling. <laughs> yeah, we had the same bunker, mate. Bit of rain overnight, so it's all a little bit wet outside, but it's uh, it's warmer and the sun shining, so it's uh, a better start to the day than it has been. With female faces you usually want to go a little bit softer on the transition so we don't want too much in the way of hard edges that's going to make it look very male um, you need to pay careful attention to the eye area I think we're going to bring her chin down to the point here Quite like that. It's not. It's not what you call an attractive lady, but <clears throat> it's got a bit of a dishonoured vibe that I quite like. Morning, Alston. I don't know why it didn't make me jump this morning. You had stopped briefly and I was looking at the screen, so I wasn't like over focused anywhere else. But let's do as you say, let's save the file. If you do it, man. You know, I was just about to say, How's it go again? You beat me to it. <laughs> right, save this head as female head two. In the component library. Oh no, I I had four even. Well, I don't know what's going on, but I've had a, I've had like a couple of people over the last twenty-four hours have ordered like wraiths and skeletons and things like that, but like. They appear to be like unrelated orders. I just find it quite interesting that like they've all suddenly kind of picked them up. I mean, I'll be honest, they're amazing models, so why wouldn't you? <laughs> you know, gotta say that, haven't I? I am biased, of course.
No, I think she'd make quite a good drow, actually. <coughs> She's got that look about her, hasn't she? I think it's the sneer. Right, let's get the uh, crossbow with a hand. Let's take that and we'll put that in. Morning, Rich. How are we doing, matey? I'm disappointed, mate. How come Elston gets a little heart and I don't?
It's all right. I'll let you off. <laughs> oh. How's everybody doing today anyway? Did you get your washing out bunker or are you still out there? Uh... Still out and doing it. made it a lot easier, hasn't it? I was just trying to move the body. So working around it, let's just remove all the stuff that's getting in my way. Not that easy for me. Oh yeah, what's your new channel then, mate? Let's have a little gander then. See if there's anyone I know. Oh, Metatron. Oh, mate, I've been watching him for ages. I love his videos. I love his no nonsense attitude to uh, like history generally. It's like he's, he's kind of like he's one of the few people like when you like what I was saying yesterday about the kind of having to kind of like uh, reinforce anything any information you find online so basically any any time you any time you look for something online or any time you find anything before you form an opinion about it or before you kind of take anything to heart or on board you should research the topic and um, look at it from other points of view and try and get a rounded thing and obviously with one of the one of the key elements to doing that is actually getting some factual factual evidence to back it up. And one of the things I love with Metatron is he always, always, always backs it up with facts. He'll he'll literally put all his source material, all his reference and stuff in your face, so like you know the guy is talking truth. So you know, there's no, there's no kind of like rewriting history with him. He's, he won't tolerate any of that stuff. It's like, you know, he, all he's, all he's going to give you is the uh, out and out facts. But I came across him a while back now. I think it was through. I want to say it was through um, Shadiversity, I think. 
because it was actually, I'll tell you when it was, it was when I sculpted the the Cult of Cain and I did the uh, upside down shields on them and I got, I got a bit of flack for it but before I was uh, designing them and when I was actually sculpting the shields I just double checked first to make sure that they were at the thing and I found a video that was either from Shadiversity or from Metatron that was talking about these punch shields where they can uh, basically like you know Dark Souls style where the point of the shield is like if you're, if you're holding it slack on your side in a relaxed position the bottom of the shield is pointing up to your shoulder like a heater shield type thing and it's because the, the the handle on it is basically horizontal straight across the middle of the shield and that was what I went with with the uh, with these guys anyway and he he or Shad did a video that was to do with these shields and basically debunking Dark Souls as if to say like you know is it practical or is it just rule of cool and uh, I think it turned out it was it's a bit of both there was, there was a bit of coolness about it but it was also the fact that you know it actually was a thing but they were designed for like you know you could basically because you're holding it as like a it's covering the back of your arm and everything else you can like basically punch with it as well so you can use it as a weapon um, but yeah it, it was it was back then that I discovered uh, Metatron so if you ever want any if anybody ever wants any impartial um, history info then check out Metatron he also does a couple of things about language where he's talking about like uh, um, like pronunciations and things like that and he, he, he's got a separate channel I think that covers off um, I think it's like uh, different like languages and how things are pronounced and looking at other channels and how they're butchering it so <laughs> he is he is very good very entertaining and he's absolutely no nonsense but he's had a bit of trouble recently i think with um he had his account demonetized because he was i can't remember what it was now i want to say it was something to do with the whole cleopatra issue but it could have been something different it might it might have just been a glitch even actually but I think he's back up and running now. He's got it all sorted again, but it should never have happened in the first place, really. But let's delete that bit. Let's go around. I'm going to steal some bits off these guys again, so we've got some consistent detailing. Let's give a uh, one of them. Which one are you watching now? The one, the one where he's talking about the Italian, uh, like sl slagging off the uh, the language channels, or the one about the Cleopatra. <clears throat> I, don't, I don't even know why it's a contentious issue. It, it's, it's ridiculous, really, because for whatever reason, like Netflix went and made a black. Well, we know the reason, don't we? It's, it's to appeal to modern narratives and whatever, but obviously when you're dealing with a factual, historical documentary, you can't ignore the fact that Cleopatra was Greek. So, <laughs> yeah. You know, she was Greek, and, like, Egyptians acknowledge that she was Greek, they know she was Greek, so it's not... There's, there's nowhere at any point is anybody trying to say otherwise until Netflix come along and do it. And you know, it's one thing when you when you're dealing with like um, things like uh, 
I don't know, like the elves and dwarves and stuff in the, you know, War of the Ring. Not War of the Ring, what's it called? The Lord of the Rings series. Because they're fantasy. You know, you can, you've got a little bit of slack there because of that. As much as you might upset the kind of the hardcore Tolkienists, but um, you know, the, the, the fact the facts are the facts, aren't they? Do you know what I mean? Like, no, nobody can really kind of get too pissy about elves. You know, not all being white because they're a fantasy race, so you can do what you want with them, really, to a point. As long as you're willing to disrespect and disregard the source material. Um, but when it comes to history, history is history. Do you know what I mean, you can't you can't get around that, no matter how much you might want it to be. And I think in his video actually there was something he said that was quite interesting. And I don't know, it made me think about it. It's, it's, it's got me wanting to like look into it a little bit more. Like I didn't I didn't realise I, I completely missed it that there was a a BBC series a while back. I want to say it was like 2016 or something like that. It's going right back where they it was a, a series of Troy or something like that. Um, I can't remember what the series. It might have just been called Troy, but Achilles was black. Um, and again, it's one of these you can't you can't do something that's historical where you're taking, you know, a Greek hero who is, and he was gay as well. Oh, there you go. That's just like they're ticking every box they can get hold of there. But you can't, you can't take a kind of renowned Greek hero and rewrite him for the purposes of like you know of TV. It's not, it's not like taking a fictional character and giving him a kind of a remake or a revisioning. Like you know, you take a character who ne hasn't necessarily had like a full description or you know there's they've never been represented visually or whatever and you can kind of create them in your own image but like Metatron's video what he says in there which is the one that got me thinking about it was actually there's tons and tons and tons of like um, like African history and things like that where you've got these like fantastic warriors and legendary legendary warriors I mean just because the Greek mythology is like you know, it's permeated into our culture and stuff like that through kind of like education and everything else. But like, the African stories haven't necessarily filtered through in the same way. But it doesn't mean they're not there, and it doesn't mean they're not amazing stories with like you know, epic heroes on par with Achilles. You don't need to go and bastardize Achilles, um, or Cleopatra, or any other kind of thing for the for the sake of kind of racial representation you go and find the ones that actually are um you know living it or did live it and do them some justice you know bring bring them to the forefront and kind of showcase the cultures i'd watch that in a heartbeat i mean i know it's not quite the same but like um what was it now apocalypto the mel gibson film from like he wasn't in it was he, he directed it but it was about the Aztecs and the Inca and stuff, the Maya. Um, and that was like, I didn't really know what I was watching. I, 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 I st I'm still not sure how much of that was based on kind of like fact and how much of it was complete just about fiction. Um, but it was a good watch, do you know what I mean? If you, if you, if you stage a, like a, you know, a, an Incan hero or an Aztec hero or something like that and throw them into that kind of, that kind of world and follow them through, You've got a pretty nifty bit of storytelling you can do, while still representing other cultures. Now, I, I, again, the. The, the Metatron video, he, he kind of talks through all the source material from, um, from uh, what do you call it, um, all the kind of the Greek, the Greek legends around, around Achilles, and he kind of literally pulls up all of the, the illusions that people have kind of interpreted to mean that he was gay, um, and it's tenuous. 
it's very very tenuous but if you think again at the time like the relationship between like two men would have been very close because they were they were they were fighting they were at war they were you know they were spending all their time together um they would have a different relationship to you know say like we would have for example because of the way that they live and the way they they, they are together it doesn't mean they're intimate with each other um <clears throat> and it's like i say that the actual the actual wording and stuff that they've 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 kind of twisted and picked up on is not on the face of it, it's not what they've made it into, if you know what I mean. But I'll, I'll get cancelled for saying this, but I watched, um, <laughs> oh, I actually watched uh, the new Ricky Gervais stand up last night, and it was funny. It was it was such a, a slam dunk against kind of like modern society and modern culture and stuff. It was just it, it didn't hold anything back. He just goes for the throat from the the minute the thing starts. Um, I'm not going to repeat any of it or even tell you about any of it. But if you think if you think woke is a is is a kind of a, a joke kind of thing, then definitely have a definitely give it a watch some of it's a bit close to the bone but what else do I want to steal off this one Okay, so she's got the... Oh, I've already put the sleeves in. I've already put the sleeves in. I should have merged all this together to save myself the, the pain of having to do this. Where's my boot cuffs that I've just put on there? Oh, I've put them on the wrong bloody one, haven't I? Duh.
so she's got lower boots now. Then we go for different trousers as well, so let's just uh, let's put a split at the side. Very intense, let's do that again. So we'll come to tatter them up again in a bit when it comes to uh, posing. Get the
the same bunker. Uh, do you see that thing that happened in Vegas? There was a flash in the sky and the sound of an impact. The family called the police and reported a six foot human like thing in the garden. God, no. No, I didn't hear anything about that one, mate. You get pictures or anything, I'm not the ring camera or anything like that. <coughs> You got an art if you got a link to the article there, fire it over, mate. I'll have a read later. Hey Dennis, how's it going mate? Tonight. Hope you keep him up. How's the sculpting going, Dennis? Got any new stuff to share? Hear that crack then that was my knuckle. Ah You're not tempted to grab a resin one yet, uh, Dennis. I think the scale of your tanks, I think the uh, resin would do it a lot of justice. I would also suggest most people that would be buying them would uh, probably be also printing a resin. <clears throat> 
Is that because that's what you're more familiar with, though, or is that because is there another reason you prefer it? Because your other option, which I'd maybe should just have a little look at, actually. Um, have you tried Shop 3D? Yeah, I get you. Yeah, let me let me just pull it up on screen and I'll show you. Definitely worth you looking into because especially if, if you're only printing uh, small amounts of stuff. So it's shop3d.io. They got bought out by my mini factory a while back. Um, okay, so basically you, you set up on here free to set up an account we go to products um, and you go uh, create your products click start oh actually that's handy that if you got a my manufacturing thing you can import from my manufacturing now oh, I should do that okay so you go upload Drag and drop your files into there. Drag and drop your images in there to showcase the uh, thing. Um, and then you can put your, uh, your your text and other bits and bobs. Let me just show you as an example. So, uh, Ray Mantle Morn, right? 32 millimeter scale miniature. Go into here. You go to edit price. Um, and you can create a variant. So, um, We've got grey resin already set up on here. If we go on to the thing here, we can go to bronze, PLA, silver, resin, copper, da da da. So we go to resin, I believe they've got full colour now as well. You can add full colour prints into there, white or grey. Um, and it will give you a price, and it gives you the price instantly. It's based on algorithms and whatever else. But this one model here, for example, costs £1.56. <coughs> so you set your price for the model. Um, they basically then take the one pound fifty six manufacturing cost, and they sell it on um, Only Games for you, uh, OnlyGames.co, and they'll sell the models to the public for you through your own storefront. Um, so platform profit refers to that. So basically, if I sell, if I sell this model through um, Only Games, um, I make two pound ninety four off the sale. If I do, um, if I buy it directly, so if I buy 20 of these models to sell at a, at a show, they charge me, well, they charge me £1.56 and I'll make £3.44 off each model. However, you have to pay VAT on that. Um, and you can do drop shipping from your own website as well. So uh, you set up drop shipping. So you go to, where is it now? Submit to store link it to your Shopify store or your um, WooCommerce store or Wix shop or whatever and you submit to store and the models go into your web store um, and whenever anybody orders from your site Shop3D pick up the order and automatically fulfill it on your behalf um, so you have to make sure your, shopping, your shipping prices correspond with what their shipping prices are the only downside to that is that they charge you VAT on the manufacturing cost and the shipping cost. So if you're not that registered, you're going to lose out quite a lot. So I would recommend not drop shipping with them until you're that registered. Because um, otherwise, all your profits will get eaten up by the the, the VAT markup. Um, but selling through their own platform, Shop 3D, using that as a kind of a Things. If I go to onlygames.co, so this is their actual website. Um, if we go to creators, it's all alphabetical, I believe. 
Uh, I think I'm in Elf and Lion's Tower. Lion's Tower, yeah. There we go. So you got all my models in here. So you can literally use this as your storefront for uh, for minis. Set up your little bio. It's all done through a little back end. Um, and yeah, you basically just sell all, sell all your gear on here. Uh, and they literally handle everything. They handle the printing. And the prints are fantastic quality, by the way. You can't knock the print quality at all. It's all done with DLP printers, so they're really, really good quality. <coughs> um, so yeah, check it out, have a little look. So it's Shop 3D is where you upload all of this stuff in the first instance and Only Games is the the platform it publishes to. But hit me up offline mate if you need if you need any help setting that up and you wanna you wanna get it all done. Give me a give me a message offline and I'll give you some steer on it. But what's nice is you can order the models at the material cost. So that model I showed you was one pound thirty four. If I want to order one of those models to test print it and check it then I can order it, um, get a batch of them together, pay the manufacturing cost only, and then um, have them shipped out to me. So if you want resin quality but you don't want the mess, there's your solution. It also means you haven't got to faff around actually, uh, what do you call it? Um, you haven't got to faff about actually doing, uh, like buying a printer, storing it, or you know, trying to figure it out and dealing with failures, they'll just sort it out for you. You don't need to do supports either because they do all the supports. In fact, if you upload it with supports, you'll be penalised for it because you'll be paying more based on resin volume. But um, yeah, that really good quality, really good quick turnaround. You can actually you can actually charge a little bit more for a five day turnaround instead of a twelve day turnaround. I think it is normally. So you can they they do it where you can add like. 20% to the uh, manufacturing cost um, to get the expedited print service. Um, right. I don't think you pay for it, mate. So, my mini factory, if you have a my mini factory store, you pay $25 a month. For only games, you can pay the standard, you, you don't pay for a store. You just pay um, for the products that you sell, uh, and they do they do offer a twenty five a twenty five dollar premium, where you can have um, like the models are sent out in packages with like your own branded packaging and stuff like that. So, oh, and you can add bases as well. So you can you can actually add plastic miniature bases there as like uh, non printed products and stuff for like. 8p a base or something so there's a, there's a lot of good stuff on there mate there's, there's, there's a, a lot of reasons to kind of want to use it but um it doesn't work for me so much trying to sell my own products through my own web store um and also having the store there um like i did contemplate when i was doing like chillcon for example i did contemplate ordering uh, all my mini stock from them because no, if I ordered like a thousand models, they'll still have it turned around to me in 12 days. Um, so you know, it's it's a good quick turnaround. I think if I was fulfilling a Kickstarter with lots and lots and lots of stuff, I'd use it. Um, but just think of it as like another tool. Do you know what I mean? It's another thing. It's another thing to help you kind of do your business, and it's good as also in that it it does lighten your load um, in terms of how much you physically have to do. So, like for me, I, I would rather print the stuff myself and sell it through my website myself, because um, my plan basically is I'm going to up level uh, level up my print farm to the point where. Haley can manage it full time, so all the orders that are coming in, she can kind of. At the moment, I'm still doing all the, uh, the, the the print orders that come in. So after the stream finishes, normally I'll get the printer running, get uh, some prints on, um, and then before the stream, I'll switch the printer over, clean some prints up, and whatever else. So 
I'm still managing the printers. And I know, like, <clears throat> and again, I don't mind talking to you guys about this. Obviously, it's not just about the the cost of the models. Isn't just about the or sorry, the price of the models isn't just about like raw material cost. There's obviously there's electric, there's printer maintenance, there's overheads like that. There's my time. There's all these other things that go into there in terms of valuing the models and putting a price on them. So obviously, you know that a model that you buy from me that costs like nine pound um, isn't costing me nine pound um, because it's it's all based on like weight uh, of the resin so say an average miniature is say an average model that we sell for maybe seven pounds on a website um Rhea mantle mourn as an example so on, on the website we charge we'd, we'd sell her for seven pounds because that includes the vat um so or seven pound twenty only games will sell it for less but they'll add the vat on at the end so you'll obviously get the the VAT is, is taken, um, is handled and stuff. So, um, actual raw material cost for me to print Rare Mantle more. And she's about uh, four grams or something like that. So it's resins five pence a gram. So let's take the weight of the model. Let's multiply it by fifty percent to allow for the the volume of supports and stuff that are like waste material, if you like. So we're talking uh, six grams worth of resin for Raya Mantle Morn at five pence a piece. So she's costing me about thirty pence to produce her. So shop free deer charging me was it one pound, one pound fifty six or something like that. Um, and they'll produce they'll produce it for the for for that, and then I get the the remaining profit. But obviously, if I sell, you know, a hundred models. Um, that's like an extra one pound twenty a model that they're charging on top of what it's costing me to produce it. So, it's do you want to maximise your profits or do you want to maximise your time? And that's the difference. If you're time poor, then definitely take the hit and get them to do it for you. Um, And they're a good. They're a bunch of good guys there, actually. Alex, Alex, I've got a lot of time for Alex, who runs it. Uh, he's the CEO. Um, I must say, lovely bloke. Actually, met him for the first time at UK Games Expo, October to say hello. So it's nice to actually see him face to face finally. I met Joe briefly as well. He's uh, been helping me out getting the Warlock. Campaign ready to launch. Oh, which actually, it is actually available on uh, my mini factory now. Uh, the Warlock, by the way, if anybody's interested, you can go to uh, my 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 mini factory page. And you can get the the Warlock. Um, in there as a campaign, so you can pick up the files that are available on the Kickstarter. I uh, haven't formally announced that yet, so I need to send out an email to everybody and let them know it's like the uh, pledge manager kind of bit is live. So hopefully, we can get a few more sales on there, get some uh, stuff picked up, and see if we can maybe unlock a couple of the extra stretch goals. So hopefully, Dennis, that gives you a bit of insight, and anybody else who's uh, looking at it, thinking about, you know, how to kind of go about selling resin models. And obviously, one of the one of the reasons to to want to do this as well. So, like with the uh, with the Patreon, so I do offer a very limited number of merchant licenses. And that's like a legacy thing, because I've always done it. So I've got a few people who are kind of like on there, um, but. Obviously, you've got to be aware that everybody's got different standards. 
Um, my standards for 3D printing are very high. Um, so anybody, anybody who's bought models off me will not be able to vouch for that and kind of like, you know, attest to the, uh, the, the print quality I'm putting out. You know, there's no support material on there if it's properly cured. Details nice and crisp and sharp. Um, you know, only the best gets through my QA. Apart from one time <laughs> when I accidentally, I completely missed like a layer slide. See Bunker's there, giving it the thumbs up. Thank you, Bunker. Um, but obviously, not everybody else has got that same kind of high standard. Uh, and there's quite a lot of people. Hopefully, hopefully, the people who are in this kind of particular category will have kind of fizzled out a little bit over the last year or two. Um, a lot of people picked up 3D printers um, during lockdown and COVID and stuff like that as a means of getting a bit of extra income, which, you know, all well and good. Um, but I had people messaging me about setting up, you know, getting a lot, they, they basically purchased merchant license off of me um, the minute they'd placed an order for their first ever 3D printer and it's kind of like there's a massive learning curve with 3D printing and there's no way that you're going to be able to buy a 3D printer and master it to the point where you can do it in a commercially viable way that is also good quality um, in that short space of time so what they should have really done is obviously learn learn offline make their mistake <laughs> Uh, bunker will put you on a crash course mate we'll get you uh, we'll get you up to speed on it fast but you've got to you've got to make your mistakes and what you don't want to be doing is making mistakes on on customer orders Do you know what I mean when you've got when you've got stuff going out on like time sensitive uh, you know turnarounds and whatever else you can't afford to be making mistakes and you certainly can't afford to be making like dangerous mistakes so we had things like uh, there was a guy I've, I've talked about it before, but there was, there was a guy on um, one of the groups and he'd been sending 3D prints out for like six months. He'd been doing it. Um, <clears throat> and what he'd done is like, he'd hollowed every model he'd ever, he'd ever printed because it saves money. So like, even like a 32 millimeter human kind of hollowed them out, which means like, you can imagine how, how bad that's going to be in terms of like the the, the saving. I've just told you that, that you know one model's costing me like thirty pence, and that's using a, a, a more premium resin. Um, you know these guys are printing out in the cheapest stuff they can find. So it's like say it's twenty quid. It's like less than half the price. So they're probably t talking ten to fifteen pence a miniature average. And this guy's hollowing everything to try and save money. So say he saves like you know twenty five percent, thirty percent. Um, Say he's got thirty percent saving by hollowing the model. It's still going to be an inferior product to somebody who's shipped a, a, a solid one. Okay, because you've got to have drain holes and all this kind of stuff. And it turns out that basically this guy had been. The reason he posted was um, he'd had a few models explode. So some stuff that was in his display display cabinet on his desk or whatever that he printed when he first started had split open and resin had leaked out of it. So bear in mind resin's like, you know, toxic and not the safest of substances. It can make it you know, give you dermatitis, it's all sorts of potential issues with it, right? So this guy gets the uh, gets his resin, hollows it all out, and doesn't put any drain holes in it or vent holes or anything else. So he thinks he's saving 30% of the cost every single time he prints. But because he hasn't hollowed it, he's basically made like a soft, a soft scented sweet <laughs> kind of thing. Hey License, how you doing? Thanks for tuning in on YouTube today. But yeah, so this, this guy, this guy's prints start exploding, um, and everything, everything he thinks he saved over his last six months. He hasn't saved any of it because every single model is now filled with liquid resin. And the problem is, like, the liquid resin over time reacts with the, the fully cured resin. And at some point, it's just going to 
burst open. Yeah, did you see all the, the uh do you see my little walkthrough on it just when I was just going through the the, the, the background? Uh the sorry, the actual platform back end. I was just explaining some of like the pricing structures and how it works and um yeah, basically just saying it's it's good to use if you if you're time poor. So if you if you need to have your time for other things, if you're running it as a side business and you you know you want a bit of family time or whatever on the evenings, or you're sculpting and you need to be sculpting miniatures, uh, Shop 3D is a really good avenue to kind of get physical miniatures, physical copies out. Um, <clears throat> let me just uh, I know I, I've literally just covered it, but I will do it again. So here we go. Let me just log in and I'll pull up the. They, they are they're very reliable. They're very good quality as well. Um, so basically, they will they will have anything shipped to you or a customer within twelve working days or ten working days. Um, you can pay for a premium setup. <laughs> yeah, Anton's not really on it anymore. Um, you're right. There's a there's a guy called uh, Alex. Um, who is the, the the CEO, and he's a great bloke. Um, but yeah, Anton's Anton's kind of like a he's a higher level rep, I think, in the thing now. But he tends to pass you on to other people. But honestly, you won't need to deal with Anton too much. He was selling it back in the day. He was their primary salesman, but now he's more of part of the my manufacturer team, I think. But they are they share staff between my manufacturer and Nerdy Games anyway. Um, but yeah, it's worthwhile doing anyway. So basically, there's two ways you can you can do it. So we go into like stores. So you've got their marketplace is only games, um, which you, you basically have your own storefront and everything else, and you sell the models there um, at prices that you set. You set the prices for the stuff. And then I've got it connected to my Shopify, but I don't use that. I've got it. Uh, oh no, in fact, I haven't ever connected to my Shopify. I had it connected to my WooCommerce, and I've had it connected to Etsy. Um, but I don't use either of these now because I'm not yet VAT registered. Um, so not being VAT registered, I'm, I'm getting charged VAT on shipping and production. Uh, and obviously that's a, a bit of a problem. I've never used metal. They, they do um, they do have it in there and it's easy to easy to kind of do. So let's uh, use the, the same model I, I demoed earlier. So Ray of Mantlemorn. So if I go here and I go edit price, um, so this is the price for just resin. So I've, I've set the price at five pound on there. So they add VAT onto that to the customer when they, when the customer buys it, and then they charge me VAT on this. I sell both. I, I it, in fact, it, for me, so my, this is what I do. This is my site, thelionstower.com. So I have uh, STLs and um, resin miniatures on here. So the stuff I sell on my site here is bought from me directly. So there's nobody taking a cut of this. Uh, resin miniatures, everything in the resin store here. This is like literally um, order come through to me. I've got a little print farm over in my office uh, in the corner. So I print the models uh, to order and ship them out. So I've got like a. a Two week turnaround on um, miniatures when it's busy. So I try and get them out as fast as possible, but I always say like, allow two weeks. Um, and yeah, this is just this is all through me. But what you can do is like Shop 3D have a thing where you can connect it to your store. So what they'll do is they'll you publish from Shop 3D. So say we go here and we go submit to store. No, no, the resin section on my website is all me. But what I can do, if I didn't want to print myself, to so say I haven't got time to do it. Well, so basically, when I first started doing like uh, when Shop 3D first popped up, I thought, well, I didn't, I didn't want to be printing all the stuff myself because I was doing it part time. So I said to them, right, what I'll do is I will focus on sculpting, and I'll let them fulfil resin orders. Um, and I had the website set up, so uh, the models were on there published here like this submit to store 
And what happens is I would get £3.44 from every sale of this model. Uh, but what is happening then is they then charge me on this price. I would be paying VAT. Um, and then I would have um, their shipping costs. So their shipping costs are like £8.50 £8 to like £10.50 um, when you're dealing with like international stuff. But say it was £10.50 uh, or £8.50 to the States. I was getting a lot of people in the States buying one model. Um, and then uh, basically they're buying one Mini and going off to... Um, going off to America for, so say they're paying like five pound, they pay five pound for the model, and then they pay the uh, eight pound fifty shipping. So, I would be charged one pound fifty six plus eight pound fifty. So that's like nine, nine pound fifty six. And I've been making three pound forty four. But that nine pound fifty six, um, no, £8.50, £9.50. So £10 and 6p I'd be paying sorry. I'd be then charged 20% VAT on £10 on ten pound and 6 pence. So I'd be charged, what's that, uh, £2, £2 and 12p. But I was only making £3.44 in the first place. So my profit per, per miniature sale then went to a pound. And back then, the prices were lower because the um, they they kind of had recommended prices, which was like it gave you a kind of a a sixty percent markup or hundred percent markup or something like that off their manufacturing cost. Um, and my my profit was eaten by VAT. Yeah, yeah, this is this is this is how it worked in the UK. Um, my profit was eaten up by the VAT, so it didn't really work out well for me. That one didn't. So not being VAT registered, I couldn't claim the VAT back. Yeah, if you don't, if you're not in the UK, they don't charge VAT. Um, so you'll be you'll be fine if you're not UK based. But basically, let them let them sell through their platform, and you go to you go to Only Games, and you basically host your store there, and you can pimp that out and use that for your marketing and sales. But you set the mo set the model up, click on um, the little plus up here to create a new variant. Go to materials. So say you want to go for like a silver one. Select colour, you basically say it's like, you know, is it polished or whatever else, antique finish or whatever. So let's go in antique finish and add that. Um, there you go. So quote not found, so you can't get that, cannot be calculated. It's probably just not optimised for, for that kind of that kind of service to be honest. Um, so that's not really helped you at all <laughs> showing you that one. Um, so yeah, so but like I say, you put the resin ones in, and they come up with the resin price, and it will just produce what you need. And then you've got an option. Then you either sell through them, so you can you can sell it through your own website um, and make that level of profit. Sell it through their website, Only Games, and make that much profit. Or you order them yourself, paying that much, um, and that then kind of they'll, they'll they'll ship a big bulk stuff to you. Yeah. Anton put a lot of people off early doors, you know, because he was quite he was quite hardcore on sales. Um, so he he did. There's quite a lot of people I know have said the same thing because he come he, he came in quite uh, with like a cold approach from um, Instagram and then various other methods, and he kind of kept coming. And I I got to the point where I was like, you know what, I'll give him the time of day and let's see what it is because it'll either stop him emailing me or it actually turns out to be worthwhile. And it turned out to be worthwhile, so. You know, I'm glad I, I'm glad I followed it up, but a lot of people kind of steer clear of it because of the way he was kind of he was pitching the sales and the kind of approaching to approaching people. Um, uh, so once once I'd kind of once I'd given him the time of day, Alex took over with me, and Alex was much better at cl explaining stuff and kind of going through things with me and kind of like helping me to get things set up. So that was that was really kind of useful. Um, and there are other guys there who do the same thing now, but don't try emailing them. Just join the uh, my jo join the my mini factory server um, and message them on there. So go to Discord. So if we go to um, if you go to Discord, there is a let me find it. Where are they now?
Oh, there we go. There you go. <laughs> well, if you go on to if you go onto uh, my mini factory, you've got create a general up here. And what you'll find is you'll uh in fact it's create a general or create a channels. I think create a general's the probably the better one to go for. Um, you can go in there and basically like message and ask them for support. So there's quite a few people in here obviously posting up issues they're having. Um, and they're quite good at kind of responding back here. Uh, and getting you information, updates and stuff. And I believe there is a... Yeah, over here, the My Mini Factory team. So these are the guys who are kind of like generally helping. So Joe is one of the guys who does uh, my stuff. He's useful to speak to. He's a good guy. Um, who was the other one now? I'm surprised there's so few of them actually in there, like marked up as a team. But yeah, Joe Joe's a good guy to speak to. So if you don't want to speak to Anton, in fact, Anton's not even on. <laughs> like, you go, go in there, you can message Joe, um, and he should kind of jump in, jump on in there and chat with you. So I've got a uh, in my thing here. I've got a Lions Tower chat. So I have I have Anton in there, uh, Yannick, Joe, and Reese Knight. So, basically, there you guys. Anton looks like he's offline at the moment. But yeah, Discord's better than email by a mile if you've got to try and get hold of the guys. But my stuff here, like I say, for me, selling di selling my resin stuff direct by just like you know taking the orders and printing it because I'm I'm doing my supports myself. Um, I'm already sorry. I'm already doing my supports myself anyway, and I already test print everything. So because I'm test printing and supporting, I've I've got all the print files. So it's really easy for me to just kind of like run off a few a few minis when I get the orders come in. So you know it's worthwhile it's worthwhile balancing it up and just see which which method works best for you. I hope that helps anyway. But yeah, I would definitely advocate using my mini, uh, not my mini factory, um, only games and shop 3D. Particularly if you just want, and, and it's it's really easy to do. And if you're struggling getting answers from the guys, message me, send me a message on Discord or uh, you know through Facebook or whatever. Um, you know, I'm happy to kind of give you some give you some steer and help me to kind of get it set up if you need it. Yeah, they're not this this is the thing you're going to find. So they're not going to actually promote you necessarily. Um, this is my manufacturer's policies. They won't offer you promotion. Um, but if you're going to be out there like pimping your own wares anyway, it doesn't matter whether you're sending them to your own website or you're sending them somewhere else to pick up your stuff. The fact that you've got a platform there that allows you to do it is obviously, you know, is good, and you're still making money out of it. Um, so the, the service they offer is reliable. Um, it's good value. It's good quality. You are setting the prices, so you know. The only problem is, is because it's a big marketplace, you can. So I, I fell victim to this one. I, I spent loads of money advertising my mini my, my, my mini factory store when tribes went live. <clears throat> so you spend loads of money advertising it, and it's like I might as well be advertising Amazon or eBay. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm 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 paying money to get people to click through to the site, and when they get there, it's not just my stuff that's there. They could be going on to like everybody else's stuff, and I could be paying for like you know them to go and like buy from Artisan Guild or uh, Titan Forge or something like that, you know. So yeah, it, it is it's a passive income and as long as you're as long as you promote it, you'll get the sales there. Um, and you know that when the sales come in, the models are checked, they're verified, they're all you know, they've got good quality control on stuff. And the, the products that they ship out are really good. And I will I would encourage you before you start selling stuff 
load the products on and order some samples to be sent out to you so you see firsthand what the customers are getting. Because it's alright me telling you this. Hey, Dicey, how you doing? Welcome to the stream today, sir. I hope you're keeping well. You're painting by the fjord again? Uh, they haven't re yeah the, the the discord things kind of come about fairly recently I think I mean in fact no I'm telling you a lie though it hasn't been a recent thing at all they've always done it um they've always used discord for communicating with with me um and I've been there since like 2019 but they yeah the I, I still say that the advice I gave before is if you have a, if you have a, a conversation, you double check everything with the with them by sending an email at the end or a Discord message, just in writing, just somewhere in writing, so you've got the whole conversation backed up. Uh, <clears throat> if they outsource, no, it's all shipped from the UK. It's, everything's produced in London. Um, so the, the, they when they first started, they used to have hubs around the place. Um, and what they found was the hubs that they were using, the, the quality control was variable in them. Um, hey, Di so what have you been up to today, Dice? So you've been uh, painting by the fjord again. So yeah, the the, uh, the quality from like the European hubs and the American hubs and stuff like that was not as uh, as good as the UK stuff. And as they started to increase the UK operation, they decided to take it all in, take it all in house. So it's all shipped from London now. But I say they'll, they'll guarantee anything turned around within 10 days no matter or 10 working days no matter how big so I, I've, I've had the conversation with them and I'm like so if somebody orders like a thousand models you can ship it in 10 days and they're like yeah so <laughs> in terms of like reliability and making sure you get them in time then it's good and if you pay for the premium thing um, I can't think what it's called now like the, the, the premium offering that they, they, they do for the uh, minis um, then you'll have uh, like the option for like a five-day turnaround, so everything gets like produced like you know quicker and sent out to customers faster and more efficiently. Um, I know they've actually got a separate site other than Only Games for selling jewellery, and I can't remember what it's called now. Um, and I don't think they've put as much. I don't think they've put as much kind of uh, time into promoting it as they have elsewhere. Let me just double check a second. A train thingy? Sounds interesting. Oh, I'm good, thank you, mate. I'm good. The sun's shining. It's not raining, so that's a good, uh, a good start, isn't it? Right, so, uh, so they've got shop free to so obviously they they do do it. I believe for these things, I think they they do it in wax. I think they're doing lost wax stuff. Um, there you go. <clears throat> On demand manufacturing for jewellery, and I know they have things like so when you're doing earrings and stuff, they actually do have the option to add non-printed parts. So you can have things like you know like earring uh, earring hooks and. Um, like silver chain and gold chain and things like that, you can add those in there. Uh, but yeah, I think I'm I'm pretty certain they do they do it in investment castings. I think they're using uh, a kind of a, a wax a wax print. Oh my god! <laughs> there you go. They do uh, they use like a wax uh, a wax 3D print that melts, and then they use investment casting to do the the actual model or the actual the ring or piece of jewelry or whatever it is um, I'm trying to find 
platform that they use because they've got they've got their own platform which is like my mini factory uh, sorry like only games but I can't remember what it's called and I can't ever find it when I look for it I don't know if they drop the platform now and they just do it as a thing but um, Just check something. If I go to the Free DC Limited, I don't think you can print in gold. Um, I've only seen metal printing coming out recently, uh, and I'm, I'm pretty certain that anybody that's offering these services, whether it's Shapeways or these guys, they've got to be doing. Um, What's it, what's it, what's it, shop 3D On there, was it? So, um, right, bear me a second. Yeah, no worries, mate. You lurk away, dude. Come on, on Instagram. But yeah, I, I'm I'm pretty certain they are printing in wax and then investment casting the models because I, I honestly do not believe they could get actual gold and actual silver printed. Um, not to that quality, at least. You know what I mean. Oh, so there are people. There are people who do the printed silver. Then. So I'm trying to find here. So a friend of mine, Lucy, was doing. Um, she was looking at making some jewelry at one point. I remember sending her the link to the platform. Now I can't find it. can't find it sorry about that yeah there, there is slash was a mine mini factory uh, slash only games platform which was specifically for jewelry but I'll be absolutely buggered if I can find it now so that means it either doesn't exist anymore um, or they've stopped supporting it because it's it's not uh, what you call it any tips on what sorry got a 
lots of tips. Never wear your socks in the bath, they'll get wet. There's one. Oh, that's a fault, and I bookmark it. No, of course I didn't. Why would I do a thing like that? That'd be too easy, wouldn't it? Yeah, she was um, she was doing some zebra sculpting, um, and she made a ring for a partner, and she had it three D printed for her and gave it to her as a as a kind of a gift. And then um, I think she was talking about actually releasing them and kind of doing like doing more of that kind of stuff. Uh, as a supplement, she, she works for. Uh, well, she works for. She owns, um, co-owns Game Tea, and yeah, it was one of the things they were looking to be looking to be doing. Uh, right, guys, I'm gonna have to just quickly duck out a second uh, because it's twelve o'clock. But more importantly, first thing for the toilet. I've been chugging cold drinks here, so that's <laughs> keeping me a. Uh, Keeping the hay fever kind of like off my throat. Uh, so I'm just going to pop you guys on a BRB. Yep, coffee sarny time, mate. Haley's in the house now, so I'm hoping it'll be all ready. It won't be, but <laughs> I can hope. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'll be back up in a bit. Uh, I won't be too long, so if you want to have a little peruse on my website, have a little browse. Bunker can throw a discount code up. Um, uh, go and have a little mooch on the store, and um, feel free to uh, to buy a few things. Okay, guys, I'll be uh, back shortly. <laughs> Better quality time. I'm the chef in this house, mate. So <laughs> Cheers for that, mate. All right, guys, I'll see you shortly. I won't be long.
Okay, guys, I'm back now. Let's get my glove back on. Let's get into some business. Let's get this uh, lady ready to go. Hey, license. Um, yeah, so usually, so there's two, right, there's, the answer is it depends. So, um, let's say nine out of ten times when I'm doing something like this that is uh, part of a set. So I don't know if I've showed you all the set on stream today, but this is, this is the set these ones belong to. So I've, I've used, I've made multiple different like armor pieces and clothing items on a standard T pose model, and I find it's quite good for doing things where you need symmetry. Um, so things where I need symmetry, I tend to do them on a T pose, but then what I'll do is I'll pose the model, um, and then I'll do a sculpting pass over the model. So things like the muscles and stuff like that, if I need to. Um, like amend like the forms and the shapes and stuff. I do that after it's been posed. <coughs> uh, folds in the cloth. I tend to do after posing to make sure that they're, you know, appropriate and they look right. Um, things like uh, billowing cloth and asymmetrical details. I can do them afterwards. So things like the skirt here, for example, on her. Um, I did sculpt it beforehand. Uh, but obviously I didn't have to pose it too much, but if I was having to do a lot of work on that, I'd probably leave that till the end. Um, but then, if I'm doing something that's very... Um, where symmetry is not a consideration at all, then I tend to sculpt, uh, sculpt the model kind of in... like pose the model first and then sculpt. But lately, for like for things like this and production type stuff, um, where I'm doing like units of things, it tends to be a T pose first, and then kind of like customize and adjust and you know make them work. <coughs> so uh, back to her. But yeah, I don't tend to use like the T pose master, so I'll use <laughs> stupid, stupidly probably a merge everything together into one file, into one uh, sub tool. And I'll kind of work with that because um, I can just isolate the things I need uh, without having to faff about. Because I think T pose master is only useful if you're doing um, oh, what do you call it? So I was just. I was just uh, kind of thrown a little bit then. Thank you to Cas uh, Cac Caxor. <laughs> I was going to abbreviate to Caxor. Thank you to Caxor for the follow on uh, on Twitch. So I just read the full the full name here, and I was trying to figure it out, and it just fr completely threw me. So apologies, I'm shortening it down. <laughs> um, lost my train of thought now. What was I saying?
come to me in a minute, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. So the Tipo's Master. Tipo's Master is only useful uh, if you work with subdivision levels. Because what it does is it takes your low. You, so you start with a low poly mesh and then you decimate and decimate and decimate to get to the level where you're detailing it, where you need it to be. Um, and then when you use Tipo's Master, what it does is it, it converts everything back down to the lowest. Um, what you call it, the lowest decimation level uh, and allows you to pose it there so you get the minimum of deformation on the final sculpt but because I don't work in uh, in that manner everything I do is um, Dynamesh and uh, Sculptress mode <coughs> like literally everything is done in those two using those two methods um, there's like there's no benefit to using T-Pose Master than there is to just merging everything into one subtool and then posing it and doing the sculpt over and stuff as I need. And then what I'll tend to do then is I'll paste it all together into the one scene here like this. So there's a ruler in this scene which uh, is off to the left somewhere. That ruler is always 100 millimeters tall. So everything in this scene is then relative to that 100 100 uh, millimeter ruler. So. As a groupie, you get to see their kind of relative sizes and make sure that they all work together as a as a group as intended. And the main thing I'm looking for, I don't want anyone's head to look too small or too big. So when you look at them as a set, it doesn't matter that some are bigger and some are smaller than others. That's fine. That's that's completely intentional as well. I've I've, I've done that by design. The important bit of information you got to look for is that the I say the heads are a relative size because if you look at people, you know, people's heads tend to be about the same size no matter whether they're kind of like, you know, four foot tall or six foot tall. And that's one of the things that's going to pull back the scale and, and kind of make it look like it's a, it's a model that's in the same scale, not a model that is, you know, accidentally too big or accidentally too small. And then when I bring it, when I bring that model into this scene, I dynamesh the entire thing, so that whole model gets dynameshed. And then I'll do a little sculpting pass, filling in any holes and correcting any details that need correcting, last minute ones. Um, and then once all that's done, pre-process, decimate, export. Speaking of actually, I need to speaking of export, I need to get the. Um, the swap bases made up, uh, supported up, sorry. Right, so I think I'm virtually on the posing now. to that last guy I did, Vigo. Oh, so he was much, much, much bigger than her.
Thank you, Bunker. <clears throat> Are you got a camera here watching me? Did you wait for me to put a biscuit in my mouth before you press that? I thought it's gone quiet. Some cheeky biscuit. Now I'm on the internet talking with my mouth full. <laughs> Let's pose our arms now. Let's merge all the bits together. Apart from the bow and the hands. I want to keep them separate still. Oh, I want the ruler, the ruler can do one. the last thing I'm going to do on his hair I think so <clears throat> let's just auto group
Okay, so that is the upper body pose. Let's get the head turned.
Thank you, Alston. How are you doing? Trying to avoid falling asleep at your desk. <laughs> Mate, I know that one. Do you know how many times I've nearly... I felt like I'm nodding off here when I'm... Got my little lo-fi beats going on in the background and... When it's quiet and no one's chatting. Tough one, man. But I feel you. I feel your pain. Oh yeah, totally. I mean, especially when you're dealing with like the the kind of the heat we've got at the moment. You know what I mean? Who, who's got the uh, incentive to work in this heat after you've eaten? Oh, I think I overdid that a little bit. <clears throat> it's just gone from like 3 million bodies to 18 million. Let's just change that resolution a bit. Let's try 600. So the facial detail is what I'm looking for. I want to make sure this level of sharpness I've got here kind of stays. That's perfect. And the stuff that's elsewhere on the body is a little bit more, a bit more pixelated. That is fine because you can't see it in most places.
You know, anytime you're doing like rips and tears and stuff like that in clothing, never underestimate the, uh, the little fold overs and bits. <coughs>
just want to run <coughs> on the inside of fingers. I'm going to run a little bit of an inflation just to make sure we're dealing with any, any gaps and cutting them off. I thought this hammer were okay with, but. Right guys, I need a name for this lady while I'm doing a hairdo. If you guys want to uh, think of some names and chuck them into the chat. Let's see what she's going to be called. And also, what kind of hairstyle do you think she needs? Oh. I right, think she should be. Think she's better with a shaved head or uh Hey Rosie, how you doing mate?
Nice, mate. Let's see how this looks. Oh uh, yeah, we'll go with that one. If anyone gets a better suggestion, this one's getting called Grace. One second. Sorry guys, just Hayley in the garden, just call them in. What's that one, Rosa? Coiler. No, I heard that one. Is that, where's that one from? Been dealing with coil packs today, mate.
<laughs> Some, someone who looks like she'd uh, kick your head in. God. Right now, I know from doing the last one, the female models are massively oversized compared to the male ones. Excuse me. Easy one. Sorry. <clears throat> yeah, the female models, the base model is actually a lot larger relatively to the male um, foil. So I'm going to have to add the ruler back in. I'm going to copy her. I'm going to go and paste her into the scene. Do you see she's massive? 
but then what we're going to do is going to move over here. Going to reorientate that, bring it to the corner. Do you know what, mate? I don't think I actually have given him daggers. That's all right. Okay, so just delete that. Dynamish level for these guys, one, three, four, four. Do you know what she reminds me of? You know, uh, Furiosa from Mad Max. That's who she reminds me of. a little bit taller. Which one's up? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, the uh, this one. Yeah, that was uh, that was yesterday's one.
Um, this is my main business. This this is like I'm full time uh, a sculptor license. So um, this is what I do. But this is whatever I said five or six streams now. That like five or six days work on all of these. So. That's typically what I'd be looking to put into the the monthly releases, and then <clears throat> other stuff I'll be working on is like projects, uh, like Kickstarters. I've got working on I'm doing Crystal Collapse with Max and Woodpecker. That's um, that's a nice little project that's going to start coming together soon. We've got the uh, commission work I do, so I do I do a fair bit of commission work as well. So. Um, not all of that can be shown on stream, so a lot of that happens behind the scenes. Like when I do the stuff for like footsaw miniatures and uh, uh, warhouse, that stuff tends to be offline. <laughs> well, Rosie, funny you should say that. The, the game I'm working on, the uh, the Mordheim type one, these will definitely be a faction for it. So. Hey, Frostgrave, mate, get him in Frostgrave. There you go. Oh, here's an idea. Shall I give a. Uh, shall I do a little bandit mage? It's a pretty decent game to be fair, and it's quite flexible. There's a lot of options out there as well in terms of because um, there is. It's quite uh, what do you call it, like miniature agnostic. So you can just use whatever you want for it, really. That's interesting. The um, D and D doesn't seem to cover. Bandit mage. <laughs> Cobalt. <laughs> what as the mage?
yeah, so the um, so basically what I'm doing is I'm, I've been working through uh, the Descent into Avernus campaign. I've been doing it for about a year now. So most of my monthly releases have been contributing towards that. So basically what I'm doing is I'm going through the campaign book. Well, I'm going through the campaign book and I'm creating all of the encounters and all the NPCs that you need. So we're probably about halfway through the campaign, at least I would say now. Um, so we've got some interesting stuff coming up. Uh, at some point I probably am going to need to put some character sheets in for certain things, I think, because there'll, there'll be stuff that I'm creating that's not going to be in there. It's like the, the bandit, uh, if I do a mage for these guys, for example, the bandit mage, that'll be required for a lot for my game, but not for D&D. So if people want to use it in D&D, then they're going to want to um, put a sheet in for it, put a character sheet together. But I've got somebody called uh, Moly, who's uh, he's a good lad. Very well versed DM, uh, and he's going to be kind of um, well. So he's going to be. He's offered to give me a hand and create some of these character sheets. So we're going to have to have a little chin wag and try and sort something out. So yeah, we're just in um, we're in El Torel at the moment. Uh, just trying to see where we're up to. Can't remember actually what page we got to on it, but. So I think we're around about page 58, so... Yeah, so next things I've got, I've got like a... I've got an incubus to make. A couple of dwarven commoners. We've got a, uh, a mother with some um, twin boys and a bow and arrow. Halfling with a halfling baker and an imp with a scroll. Um, a few more ghast and ghoul variants, which will be interesting. And then we've got a uh, of rock. Well, it won't be a rock; it'll be a set of them, so maybe three to five. If you're not sure what they are, it's like a dark crystal, the big bird guys kind of thing, similar to that. Another bunch of zombies, which keys into an undead release I'm working on. Um, a white be shy, which is a different uh, a type of demon, type of devil. Giant crabs. Then we got a bandit captain. Oh, that's what I need to do actually next. Before I do this mage, I need to do some uh, insane bandits. So what I'm going to do... So these are bandits that are almost ghoulish. I'm going to take... Um, let's just save it first. Hey, it's Riz. How are you doing? <coughs> Yep, everybody loves zombies. I've already done six uh, for the campaign. Um, let me show you my zombies because I'm quite pleased with my zombies. Come on. Where are you? Ah. Yeah, there's my zombie horde. So we got the uh, first female zombie. We've got a second one with all the guts hanging out. Half a face missing. We've got the uh, I can't remember if I said he was gonna. I think he was a blacksmith or a baker. Blacksmith, I think. 
and then we got the uh, a male zombie, a priest, and a mercenary. So I'm, I need to do now from memory. I think I need about eight of these mercenary type ones. And that's for the Lost Minds of Pendelva campaign. So I need to make sure there's a good group of these. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a group of the mercenary ones, and then I'm going to extend the group of peasants. So the actual, uh, the, the normal kind of like, normal people if you like, they're all going to be uh, also added to. So by the time I, oh, uh, and different species as well. So there'll be there'll be some dwarfs in there and some elves. Because otherwise the undead are just terribly racist and only only interested in humans, <laughs> or speciesist or whatever. <clears throat> Uh, no, that's just, um, it's just, uh, what do you call it? God, what's it called now, guys? A splint mail? Splint mail. Yeah, just like splint mail armour. Um, I'll show you it's, uh, I'll show you on the mercenary company, you'll see what I'm on about. Um, There you go. So these are my, these are my like flaming fist mercenary guys. And this is what the, this is the armor set I use as the basis for that like, that's, that one zombie. So it's just splint mail. And it's just, obviously, it's just layered up and layered up. It's not dissimilar to samurai armor, but the intention with this is it's leather with like little metal plates bolted to it. Creepy American. So we're going to do some uh, some gibbering, slavering bandits now, which will be cool. So these are these are bandits that are like they've, they've been driven insane by basically being in hell, essentially, or in a vermis at least. Um, So I'm going to take one of these guys, let's leave the armour on. So when I'm when I'm opening the mouth on the model, it tends to go from the corner of the jaw, so just in front of the ear, which is obviously where your actual jaw is. Mask down uh, across to the mouth line, and then invert my mask. And I want the I want this up here. Now obviously that looks a. Uh, Bizarre because his mouth is a solid piece at the moment, but sort that out. Oh no, this is all out of my brain. I, I rarely concept anything because, first off, I don't have the money to pay somebody to concept for me. Except in, you know, 
particular circumstances. So, um, you know, not not being able to pay anybody, um, I just do it myself. And then obviously, if I'm going to sit and uh, spend time drawing, I might as well be spending time sculpting instead. So, I, I concept in 3D on the fly. So occasionally I have like I'll have reference images on my screen or whatever, but you know, never a never a, a kind of a fixed concept. So like for these guys, I, I've I've kind of gone into the build like knowing I'm making uh, bandits, um, and that's pretty much it really. I haven't really kind of I haven't got a, a brief beyond that. Five human bandits, I think, is the the total of what I need. So I've gone above and beyond and I've added to them to kind of give a little bit more variety. Because I know people use these as like, we'll use them as like Frostgrave warbands and stuff. So in the interest of kind of making sure there's a good selection of thematically similar models, that's kind of where I've gone if you like. But yeah, all, all out of my own brain, just sit there and just, you know, form an idea of what I think a bandit looks like. Um, and then make it happen is kind of how it works. Oops, that's a bit intense. Oops, that's uh, that's all that as well. Where's the steps and the drives a tram van? <laughs> well, te technically they're brigands in this, not not bandits, but it's the same, isn't it?
a bloody hell how did I end up with that? How did I not notice the legs were there the whole time? Disconcerting having the eyelids just free floating above the earth. Taking a long time to save now. I think this file's getting big. I might have to do some pruning in here and kind of reduce some file sizes. Um, right then. So, Let's, let's make this guy more sinewy, more scrawny. No worries, Rosie. You take it easy, matey. You have to square you up with a set of these when you're done. When, it's, when they're done, rather. Have a lovely afternoon, mate. Yeah, I'll, yeah I'll, I'll sort you out. <laughs> Just keep reminding me, don't let me forget. You're not online. And dogs. That's what we need, dogs. Yeah, do you know what? The, um, the thing with concepts is quite often you get like... I'll show you. I'll show you what I've had to work with with um, with uh, Chris from Cursed Empire because it's quite a good example, actually, of um, 
of the kind of the artwork clients provide. This is actually better than most, if I'm honest. Um, but it was designed. It was so the models came later. The artwork came first. So the reason the artwork was done was to kind of populate the art book and use for cards um, for a card game. So the artwork is beautiful. But then I end up having to kind of like make up a load of extra stuff. So uh, it's like here, this guy for example. Lovely bit of information for the top part. Bugger all for the legs. Because <laughs> he was in the uh, in the image he was composited with uh, multiple others and then obviously when he became a card they did that with him so he didn't need the uh, the rest of the data this guy not bad he's got pretty much all the information I need back legs missing obviously but uh, and then this guy again similar kind of thing but we're missing the in leg information so the feet I can kind of figure out What kind of stuff is it you're after? Is it miniatures or are you looking for artwork? Here's another example. <clears throat> so again, lovely bit of artwork. But then we have things like, th this one caused me a few issues because when we were looking at it, and I've got to make this guy. So all these little notches on his shoulders, these are kind of like kill markings. Except it could also just be that he tried to swing the sword and these spikes are kind of like maiming his shoulder. <laughs> so like the actual armor, pi armor piece, as cool as it looks, completely impractical for just movement. And again, the guy, the guy who drew this, fantastic artist, he just kind of did it as, a, as something to do. He just did it for his own for his own um, amusement, just just general art practice. Um, and Chris at Cursed Empire kind of went through his portfolio and went, oh, that's brilliant, can I have that one please? Can I have that one, can I have that one? And kind of collected a load of art from him. So he kind of bought the, bought the license for these pieces. And then he's kind of adopted them and turned them into characters which is fantastic but then obviously when they're not designed as miniatures there's a whole level of interpretation then that has to go on and redesign to kind of like still keep the the feel of the character there but also get the um, practicalities in so obviously when I pose this guy I've got to pose him and make sure that these ones don't spike in yeah none of them right either they're all they're all uh, they're all hand drawn Chris actually won't use any AI in his artwork so everything everything in Cursed Empire is thing but AI art, oh my god, that is awful stuff to try and work from. AI art is like photo bashes where you've got like all these little details that don't really belong there and you've got to try and figure it out. Um, that one, I believe, is about... That piece of art I've just showed you, I think is about three years old, if I remember right. Um, there you go, 20, 2021. September 21 that was made. But yeah, so I say the artwork varies greatly. Um, there's, I mean, there are, there's a lot of different things. Sometimes it's easy for them to just give me a brief uh, and say, this is what I want you to make. Um, the ideal kind of, uh, the best, the best stuff I had, actually, just let me let me show you this as a as a reference, um, was from Jazza. Don't, don't know if you know Jazza on YouTube. Um, I did some sculpts for him for his his game, and there was a <coughs> there's a couple of characters I did. So one of the characters ended up being. <coughs> modified and redesigned beyond the actual drawing so the, the original illustration was kind of it was sculpted to that and then the brief tweaked and changed on the way through um, and it became something something completely different 
I say completely different. The pose changed and some of the details changed. Um, so there was all of that. Yeah, that's him, mate. That's him. You see him sometimes on um, on stream with his brother uh, Shad on Shadiversity. So this this was the this was the character sketch he gave me for this one character. This is the one that changed a lot. So this was the character brief. So it had a lot a lot of different things to um, to kind of get working on. And then what we ended up with was uh, I mean I'll be honest, it was it is an awesome model. I really enjoyed doing it, so what I ended up with was this. So that was the sculpt I did for him. So obviously you can see he's got like, you know, from the from the original concept to the um, final character. You can kind of see it's in there. But you can also see there's a lot of tweaks and changes. Like the, the fist ended up getting made about five times bigger than it was originally. <laughs> so and I had to change he originally started out a lot smaller. And he ended up having to be become bigger, so he like like he grew up a, like he went from being a kid to being a teenager. Um, but yeah, you know, it was a, it was a good design. The, the first one though is the one I'm looking for. Let me just try and find it because he he sent me this is the second sculpt I did. So somebody had already started this one, and uh, I had to come and bail him out because it was it was half finished and not usable. Um, so then he sent me. But he was, he was a very good person to work with, Jazza was. Um, this was the sketch he sent. So this was like, it's not massively detailed, but it's enough. Gives you a feeling of the pose, gives you a bit of movement. You get an idea of the details, but it's not so specific that I haven't got freedom to kind of like work on it. Uh, and the model we ended up with was, There you go. That was the end model. So you can see the certain details changed, certain things were a little bit different. But you can see how the kind of the initial sketch has kind of, kind of come through. But the reason this was good is because the front and the back married up. Um, I think what he did was he basically taken this image first, drew this one first, and then flipped it horizontally, and then using the silhouette redrew and redesigned the, the back of the model. Um, so you get kind of a good idea of what's going on in the back. Oh God, that was. Uh, it was Ty at Table Flip Foundry. He was doing some supports for him, um, and Ty he bait jet jet zip. Get me that. Ty was doing supports for a project for Jazza, and then Jazza asked him if he knew any any good uh, sculptors for different works, and he recommended about half a dozen of us. Um, and then Jazza came over to me and asked me to to do the work with him, and I enjoyed I enjoyed working with Jazza on that one. But he hasn't um, he hasn't done a lot more since. I'm surprised actually. I thought he was going to kind of come back. I thought he was going to be a kind of a recurring, a recurring thing, kind of like you know working on more of these kind of things. But it was a small, uh, like uh, what do you call it, uh, like a mobo type. Mobo is that the right thing? Like the online battle games, you know, like like. Uh, oh God, I can't remember what it's called. Like Raid and League of Legends and stuff like that. It was like a, a tabletop version of those kind of, those kind of games. Um, but yeah, like I said the reason I was showing you that was like obviously, like I said the artwork he provided. It had enough information front and back. Hey, Zanderfell, how you doing? I don't know. They didn't need them to keep warm, and they like the look of a cape because a cape's cool. Good point, though. 
gives you a good bit of movement, doesn't it? When you, you know, if you're uh, prancing around, it makes it a bit flouncy. But I think I think the world would be a better place if people wore more capes. If I'm honest. But yeah, I think um I say when you're dealing with when you're dealing with like client work and stuff, it's good to have it's good to have a really good idea from the beginning. So for me, the way I the way I kind of work it is I work on a basis of like four hundred and fifty pounds a sculpt. Um and that's with the client providing artwork like like like, like Jazz providing me for example. Something like that that is usable. So if the client doesn't provide usable artwork and I end up doing design as well. Um, I add an extra hundred pound to the fee, and that's the design charge. And the reason for doing that is because there's going to come a point where I'm, I'll, I'll design something, I'll sculpt it. I'm doing a design on the fly in my head, um, and then I'm going to have to send it to the client to get it approved. And the client might turn around and go, "Not keen on this. Not keen on this. Don't like that. Redo that bit." Da 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 da. And then I have to go back, and it becomes an iterative process. So when you're doing like iterations of work. Um. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, Zander. Yeah, get rid of guns and make everyone use medieval weapons. I think you'd be a bit more in in, in a bit more fear of uh, you know stepping up and putting your neck on the line, wouldn't you? Then. Yeah, I, exactly. It's it it it, 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 it is Riz. <laughs> Sorry, mate. You like, Names baffled me there. I just couldn't even get it out of my mouth. Um, yeah, if you've got to engage your brain and think more, it leaves you more tired. Like it's a, it's a harder job. And then obviously going backwards and forwards with the client and getting it approved and things like that. And then client requesting tweaks and changes. And then the worst is when the clients haven't quite got the like. <laughs> there's a, a a guy I work with, Andy, and I, I love Andy and I love working with him. And quite often it's kind of a case of, I don't know what I want, but I know what I don't want. So I'll, I'll know if I want it or not when I see it kind of thing, you know. And it's like, I understand the, the thought and the process there, but obviously what it means then is that you kind of, you can end up sinking hours and hours and hours into the work and you kind of like, it's tweak this, change this, that needs to go, get rid of that, put this in instead try doing this da 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 and in the same time I could have sculpted like six or seven miniatures for myself um, <clears throat> and it's always this you know this whole kind of uh, this to in and fro in and back and forth and whatever else and leaving it a little bit woolly um, can make the whole like sculpting commission kind of thing a lot more difficult <clears throat> pondering how to charge more than quoted price for something just because I have to clarify what the concept is actually trying to show and then to come up with design and puts myself well one of the things I would suggest is like with um, so you want a sculpting contract when you start a job um, I do have some template ones if you want one hit me up afterwards and I'll, I'll fire it over to you you can use it but basically it outlines the responsibilities of everybody involved um, and the contract I use, particularly I use this when I'm, I'm dealing with customers who I've never dealt with before. If I've if I've if I've dealt with a client like you know half a dozen times and I'm familiar with them and we know how each other work and stuff, it's less important. But when you're dealing with somebody new, you need it. You need it in there. And what you want to do is say like you know this this design process includes X number of um, alterations. You know. Ah, oh, cheers, bunker. Yeah, this this includes X number of alterations, so you can, um, you know, I'll do the model once, and then at, at various stages, I'm going to like show you the model, and I'll allow you to make changes to that model, request changes three times, um, and anything after the third time, any any alterations after the third time are charged by the hour at X amount of hourly rate. Now, obviously, you can't do this later on down the line unless you have a discussion with the client and they agree to it if you just say to them look you know I can either hand it over to you as it is um, and take the fee for you know take the deposit and everything else now you can, it, I'll, I'll hand it over as it is but I can't finish this for you 
or you say, look, I'm sinking more hours into this than, we, than, we, than I've budgeted for, you know, because you're making changes. So will you meet me halfway and agree to pay X, X amount extra for um, for the alterations? <clears throat> and they might they might say no, and then it kind of leaves you in a bit of a predicament. And then it's down to you then whether you want to kind of pursue that commission or whether you kind of say, actually, you know what, it's it's too much hard work dealing with you. Because some clients some clients are just going to be nightmares, and you're never going to get away from that. There's always going to be that that one client who just you know they they want the earth on a stick. And nothing you ever give them is going to be enough. Um, and what you don't want to be doing is like, like you say, sinking in hours and hours and hours of extra work because uh, it, it it drains you. It it, it literally will like, destroy your willpower and willing to to do the job. And then when it becomes a chore, that's it. You're never going to get it finished then. Um, but yeah, the contract the contract basically covers that off. And then the other thing that the clients do that I've I've encountered quite a lot is they'll say, right, <clears throat> here's here's four models I need off you. And then halfway through sculpting, they'll start adding to it. Oh, actually, I need this as well. Uh, oh, and I need uh, and I need one of these. And can you do me a variation of this one with you know this weapon and that head and that that that. Um, and what you what you kind of need to make sure uh, is in the contract, which I say it's the standard in my one is. Um, once we've agreed the contract, we'll agree the deliverables and the deadlines and everything else, and that will be, you know, that will basically be that contract. If you then add to this beyond that, it's not an amendment to this contract; it's a new contract. You know. I'll do the stuff that you've, we've covered off in the first one by the deadlines as, as agreed and everything else, and that will be that will be part one of the the agreement. And then once you've handed it over, once I've handed that over, we'll begin the alterations and the thingies that you've, we've agreed for the second part of the contract. But it means that your your delivery your delivery is not going to be adversely affected by the client adding to your workload. So it's uh, it's one of the things you've always got to be careful of. Because I know, like I, I kind of allow in my calendar. I've got like I've got like days put aside for client work, and I've got stuff uh, days put aside for like my stuff and admin work and various other things. And if one client pipes up and goes, actually, what I need you to do is five times more work than we've already agreed, but I need it on the same deadline. <clears throat> it's like well, I've budgeted the days now for the next three or four months. So where am I going to get? You know seven or eight more days or whatever it is to do these extra things that you've asked for and um, kind of still be able to deliver everything else I need for all the other clients so this is why this is why you need to have like deadlines and um, everything else all nailed down and <clears throat> another another critical thing as well is is a uh, if you're dealing with teams of people, like there's, there's, there's one job I'm doing at the moment where I'm dealing with uh, like a committee. So when I do the sculpt, I have one point of contact. So all of my instruction, all of my dealings are with one person out of this committee. But they then go back and they present to the committee what, what I've done. Um, and then the committee either approves it or they request changes. And then that one person comes back to me. Because obviously the danger is... I. I'm in contact with like multiple people in this uh, in this committee. Um, if I take instructions off different people, and the instructions vary from person to person, or this person asks for X, Y, and Z, where this person asks for A, B, and C, and I end up delivering both and then kind of billing them for it, they ain't going to be happy about that. So it's, they have to confirm between themselves what they've got and come back to you with one single source of contact. Yeah, this is it. You know, they, they they come back and they ask you for five times more. Then it's it is literally a case of, you know, it's more work, it's more commissions. It's not an amendment to the original contract. You can't add things like that onto it. And sometimes they're kind of like, oh, you know, it's it's a uh, it's fine. I'll pay the extra money. But it's about planning the work and the deadlines that you expect. If you're so if you let's say your client decides they're going to get arsy with you and they're going to hold you to the contract, right? So you've got a contract that says. I'll deliver all of this work by the end of August. And then the end of August comes and your client's kind of uh, 
you know, middle of July, they turn around and go, I need to do these extra five or six models. So you take these extra five or six models and you're trying to include them in the thing, but then the end of August comes uh, and you're not ready because they've added five or six more models to your collection. So your your deadline gets pushed back and overruns. So if you've got a real arsehole of a client, they could then turn around to you and say, well, actually, the contract says you've got to have everything handed over by August. You're in breach of your contract, therefore I'm not paying you for the work. <clears throat> so it's always thinking the worst of people, but you don't know these people. Do you know what I mean? This is, this is what you've got to think. You don't know them. So you need to make sure that all of these eventualities are covered off up front um, and that you've got the you've got the communication and the contract like nailed down so you kind of say right this is the parameters of our contract if you want anything else we do a new contract and it's an it's another different job that will be scheduled differently or whatever else um, and then the other thing I've spoke about a few times is like you'll have a lot of issues when um, not issues you have a lot of occurrences where you have a, a conversation with people even if they're your mates, even if they're friends, even if you perceive them to be friends, whether they are or not, after you've had the conversation and you've taken a brief from them and you agree what you're doing, you send them an email or a WhatsApp message or something, um, some form of written communication that says, as per our conversation, these are my takeaway points. Dot 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 dot. Bang 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 bang. And just bullet point out everything, right? It's just all of the all of the agreement points you've made. Get them all uh, discussed. And then when you when you um, send that to them, if they turn around to you and go, "Oh, hang on, that's not how I understood it. That's not what I was saying." Um, you know, you kind of say, "Well, okay, what is your understanding of it?" And then they have an opportunity to kind of correct correct your understanding in writing. Um, and that, that saves the situations that, and I don't know if you've ever had this, at work. If, you, if you take this to your day job as well, absolutely use this in every, every aspect of life. If you've got, if, have you ever been in a meeting where somebody's given you stuff to do and then you've gone away and done it and then later on they've pulled a flanker on you and they've gone, well, I never asked him to do that. Or actually, what I asked you to do was this, and you know they're they're throwing you under the bus because it it saves their ass, and because you've sent them an email saying right this is what you asked me to do am I correct yes okay the point when they don't reply to you and they don't correct your email or anything else. If they if they don't respond if they respond saying yeah all good then you've got it in writing. If they don't respond to you, they still had it in writing from you that you are confirming your understanding of what their discussion is. And the fact that they haven't like changed the parameters and they haven't corrected anything means that they're accepting it. So in the interest of ask covering in all aspects of life, always do that. Do you know what I mean? It makes sense. I say I speak from I speak from first-hand experience because I've been burned with this. Just a little bit of sculpting on now. I'll have to log off in a minute because I've got some customer orders I've got to get processed and some bits and bobs I've got to get done. Yeah, four hundred and fifty pounds for a mini. Uh, so if you're dealing dollars, that's about is that about five fifty six hundred dollars maybe. Um, and the other thing, the other thing not to do as well is agree hourly rates. So you need an hourly rate if you're going to be charging hourly extras. So make sure you've got that. But again, like one of the things I fell into uh, a, a trap with. I say a trap. It was my own, my own naivety and kind of like. You know, failing here really there's nobody else to blame for it but the um the thing i ended up doing was i ended up charging hourly slot again with, with chris at cursed empire 
Um, you know, he's a mate I've worked from worked with him a long time. Uh, and I agreed an hourly rate for all the work. And it was all based on the amount of time it took me to do a model. So, um, I mean, you've, you've just seen me do a model today on stream in, what, four hours or something like that, maybe? The female, um, the female crossbow woman. So, I priced, I priced it all based on an hourly rate. So I'm kind of like right, okay. So, uh, 450 pounds uh, for a model divided by 12 hours, which when I first started was kind of how long it took me to do one model. Um, you know, 450 pounds divided by 12 hours gives us, you know, whatever. What's going on here? Oh. So yeah, four hundred and fifty pounds divided by twelve hours gives us like you know, yeah, thirty-seven fifty. I'll knock a fiver off um, for mates' rates. Let's call it thirty-three pounds an hour. So start off doing sculpts at thirty-three pounds an hour, um, and then skip forward to like three years down the line. I'm doing models that are, that are twice as good in terms of quality. In four hours instead of twelve hours. Now, who loses out in that situation? Do you know what I mean? Like, I am now being penalised in that situation for being more effective, for being faster and better. Whereas, actually, it should be the opposite entirely. Do you know what I mean? So, my my advice to anybody going into like freelance work is do not price hourly stuff you know if you're in if you're in a, an employment contract with somebody then yeah they're going to price they're going to give you an hourly rate that's fine if you're a freelancer you do it by the job because trying to go back now and uh, have this conversation about you know you, i'm actually doing myself out of work i think like I, I worked out like if i'd have if i'd have charged full price for the all the sculpts i've done i'd have, I'd have made I'd have ended up charging about an extra seven thousand uh, pounds for all the work I've done. So, um, yeah, it just does. It doesn't stack up at all. Do you know what I mean? So, it's uh, it's it's some difficult conversations having to be had then, and like you know, trying to figure out how to make it work for everybody. Because, you know, obviously, the client is getting a good deal, and he knows it, um, and he's going to want to kind of keep that, and you know, he's not really going to want to pay four times the amount for the same things he's been getting so it's a uh, so clients from the states um, yet yeah, so basically what I always do I invoice in pounds sterling um, so the clients will need to pay in pounds sterling so that, that's it really I suppose <laughs> never really have any issues I mean sometimes there's a pound or two discrepancy because of exchange rates and currency fluctuations and things but you know for the most part you know if I, if I invoice 500 pound I get 500 pound pretty much through no matter where the client is um, and again when I'm sending money to people overseas I always send it in their, their native currency which means that I'm taking a hit on the exchange so Yeah, I've seen a lot of that as well. You got like, I mean, uh, we said before, you know, a lot of these uh, companies they're run by money men, the uh, sculpting sculpting companies. They're run by money men, and they know they can go to like Pakistan, they can go to the Philippines, and whatever else, and they can get to all these places, and they can get um, stuff sculpted for next to nothing, and they know it. So they're going to come to you, and they're going to say, you know, can you make can you make these models for us, and this is what we're paying, and they want like. You know, for a single model, they want to pay like hundred and fifty dollars, and it's like, you know what? I, I'm not getting out of bed for hundred and fifty dollars. I'm certainly not going to be sculpting all these models for you. I had, a, I had a guy asking for the same thing we wanted as dragons, hundred and fifty, hundred and fifty quid a dragon, I think it was. It's like no, you, you know, you're talking ten times that if I'm going to sculpt you a dragon, easy. Uh, I I don't tend to use PayPal if I can help it. I try and I try and just use bank accounts. So 
I've got a business bank account with um, an IBAN number, so um, people can send me like use they can use my IBAN uh, to do uh, international transactions. Obviously, you can do you can do PayPal as well. The problem with PayPal is like um, if people pay you in dollars in PayPal and you're in pound sterling, like for me at least, it sits in different money pots. So I can pay for something in dollars using my dollars pot but if I try and draw my dollar pot down into my bank account which is pound sterling PayPal's gonna kind of charge me the fees so <clears throat> it's it's a little bit of a, a bit of an unusual one and I get this I actually get this with my uh, with my business site so um, I'm gonna get clocking off in a sec but let me just uh, let me just show you so if I go to I, guess my, I don't. I don't know why I'm actually showing you this because it doesn't. It doesn't make any difference. But like, on my website here, like I've got it all in, in pounds. But I can. So I can change it. And you're seeing all the prices in dollars now. And what I'm finding is, I, I get people who, um, so people who make purchases on on the website. Um, there's two different ways you can pay. So you can pay, well, say two different ways you can pay. There's loads of different ways you can pay, but basically one of the ways is like a PayPal, um, a PayPal payment. So you can use a PayPal, or you can use like all of the various different methods through the the, the the kind of the Shopify checkout. The Shopify checkout pays me out um, a chunk, you know, every 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 couple of days or whatever. It'll say like you know this is how much you're getting paid in this payout, whatever. Um, but sometimes people use the PayPal option, and the money goes the money from that transaction will go straight into my PayPal account. Not into um, not into the kind of the Shopify payment pot. So when the when the money goes straight into my PayPal account, I end up with you know a, a twenty five dollar order being paid for that lives into it lives in the PayPal account. Then and when I draw that down, then I get hit with the extra fees. So that's that's where kind of like where that one kind of catches me out. For the most part, customer or uh, client orders, it doesn't matter because I'm. I'm invoicing them and they're paying directly into my bank, but with customer orders through the website, it can it can be a thing. Um, then we've got like, you know, the uh, the normal the normal I say normal the Shopify kind of payment method. Um, you know, no matter where they pay from in that, it'll give me pound sterling at the proper rate so I think it converts at the point of sale Chair or door? Which one are we talking about, sorry? Oh, it's, it's my door behind me, sorry. It's quite warm out and it's uh, it's been... Um, quite, I've got 26 degrees in my office at the moment. And it's, uh, it's quite warm, so I've opened the door for ventilation. And yeah, it... it Needs a bit of WD forty from the sound of things, but I've kind of shut off to it. <laughs> is it. Is it really noticeable? Is it like really off-putting in, in the background?
<laughs> yeah, I'm not. I'm not moving. What's going on here? Why is that happening like that? <laughs> oh yeah always let's say I'll merge the whole thing together like this and this will, this will be how I pose it this is this is basically what transpose master does for you except when I'm working I I'm, I'm using dynamesh and I'm using um, sculptures pro so what I'm gonna do is gonna put um, that 600 resolution on there I think and then uh, groups on and dynamesh the whole thing Okay, that's it. Let's take that now and just <laughs> um, no, it's Who is that? Yeah, only on only on the weekends. <laughs> <laughs> Bunker, if you make mistakes, I don't even see them, man.
<laughs> oh yeah, you, you, that's it. I think there was a there was a thing, isn't it, that if you is it if the last and first letters are in, are in the right place, everything else in the middle can be just complete garbage. As long as all the letters are present and the last and first letters are in the right place, you can figure it out and read it without any trouble, really. Yeah, so a ghoul is a living, a living being, isn't it? Who has, who basically eats corpses. Um, so I believe there is a differentiation between them. So this is this is a ghoul rather than a, a zombie. Yep, there you go. <laughs> Couldn't believe I could actually understand what I was reading. The only important thing is that the first and last letter are in the right place. It's weird that it happens, but you know, it definitely does. Oh, you shit bag, come on. How do I got fingernails? Uh, I'll show you in a second. I tend not to bother, to be honest. On on, on 32 millimeter scale miniatures, you tend not to see them. Um, I do them on ogres. So, like, if I go back and show you the uh, the set we've got here, so you'll see it. none of the normal characters will have fingernails, just because it's not it's not really viable. Um, there's a very very slight kind of indication of them but for the most part you're not actually going to see them when you come to the ogre obviously they're going to be a bit bigger I literally just draw them in and then sculpt a ridge on the end so I've just, I've just carved the shape and then I'll just use the uh, orb cracks brush inverted and then just go over that edge and then just polish out the area and then I tend to add a few little uh, you know, like little line. Oh no, wrong one. I'll add like a couple of like little, little lines to it. I won't do it on this one now because it's he's already done and exported. Where's my little gibbering bugger? <laughs> yeah, they're just they're just detailed on a to break up the mass of like plain solid uh, like masses. Because obviously, when you're dealing with miniatures, sometimes you want a little bit of texture to indicate that something is what it is. And those little lines are quite good to indicate like bone and chitin and stuff like that. So you've got horns, you can put them on there. You do them fingernails, they go on. Uh, da, da, da. 
Oh, Xander, sorry. Uh, so, how do I? How do you make a D and D? How how do you make a ghoul in a D and D role play world? Um, are you talking about as a as an enemy character or as a as a player character? I think if I'm doing it as a as an enemy character, <clears throat> they're basically going to be driven by like a hunger for rotten flesh. Um, they're going to be quite cowardly. But I would say that the, the desire for for the uh, rotten flesh is going to be kind of like paramount over everything else with them. But if you got if you got suggestions, you want a table and you fire away, mate. Always happy to hear other people's viewpoints and see what you think. Oh right, you're talking about ah right. I didn't get that was where you were going. I thought you were literally talking about role playing as a ghoul rather than uh, how to create a ghoul. <laughs> yeah, I've got a couple of cool ghoul characters I've got to make up soon. So oh. Uh, where to look for or find commissions? So, you, are you looking for commission work? Is that what you're after? It's a tricky question because it. <clears throat> what you kind of need to do is kind of make friends with people. Um, as, as silly as it sounds, like people who are who are like hiring for work, if you know what I mean, <clears throat> so that they they know who you are. And sometimes, obviously, the like physically sculpting something. Uh, or getting a physical sculpting commission up and might not be necessarily like right on the doorstep you've got to kind of foster a relationship but you want to make sure that when they <clears throat> when they know they need something come, uh, to, to be done that they're going to come to you for it so get yourself a uh, like a rate sheet together so they know how much to you know you're going to be they're going to be paying for various different things um, see the, this there's a couple of issues that you're going to have, I think. <clears throat> so, for like me, I'm quite lucky because I'm, I've am i been around for quite a while. A lot of people kind of know me. And people who work with me, they tend to want to work with me because I am me. Because they know who I am. Um, and they already know how much I'm charging. So that doesn't tend to be a discussion we tend to need to have. <coughs> I do have it. But it's not, uh, it's not like we have a discussion and they go, oh, how much you charge? £450 a sculpt. Oh, that's a bit much. We can't really afford that. Sorry, I'll go somewhere else. 
so <clears throat> that's not um, not a big drama the second thing is um, other than people coming to you keep an eye out on Facebook wait until people ask a question be in, be in the right groups for it for a start um, pipe up and say like you know when when stuff's going on um, people asking for quotes or they want to know exactly that question you make sure you're there to kind of throw your hat in the ring but do it with a proper portfolio of proper models so <clears throat> and I don't know if I don't know if you've seen this on any of my videos before so say you wanted to work for Games Workshop or you want to kind of sculpt models in the style of Games Workshop you need to make sure that you you've you've got that kind of thing in your portfolio so Games Workshop aren't going to look at my portfolio of work as extensive as it is and kind of go brilliant fit let's get him in because I don't sculpt in Games Workshop style I'd need to learn to sculpt in Games Workshop style in fact I know for a fact because they've offered it to me um, if Games Workshop want me to work for them I'm going in as a trainee I've been sculpting for 20 years and I'm going to be going in as a trainee because I need to learn their, their technique their style and actually lately they tend to want to higher from within the um, like within the painting team so we see people like Darren Latham becoming sculptors because he's a miniature painter so <clears throat> oh I've not seen that before yeah that, that tends to be what they do the, the apprentice and type thing one area I think you'll absolutely nail it in, if it's of an interest to you, um, is historical miniatures. So there is a massive, massive shortage in the industry of people look, uh, of of historical sculptors. Um, I get asked for it a lot, <clears throat> and for certain people I'll take it on, but it comes with its own fair share of headaches because. You can't wing it, you can't guess, and you can't get it wrong. So I did a shield for Footsaw. So it was a Spartan shield, and they sent me various bits of reference, and I used various bits of my own that I found. Um, and I did an Athenian shield, and I did a, a Spartan shield for the Mortal Gods release. And it was both the same shield blank template I'd made, with the crest on there, so the Athenians had the owl, and the Spartans had the upside down V. Now, when I was looking at it, I put I saw a, a shield with a Spartan thing. It had rivets around the outside. I thought, ah, oh, that's pretty cool. I'll do that. So I did like a, a ring of rivets around the outside of the shield. Um, either or, and uh, like historical, as in like historical, as in like once upon a time, it would have been a person running around a battlefield in real life. So it could be like modern warfare type stuff, or it could be World War Two. It could be Napoleonic. It could be uh, Dark Ages. Any anything. The problem is you get the rivet counters in, and <clears throat> if you get anything wrong on the sculpt, they'll pick it to pieces. They'll literally pull it apart. And I was told I had to take all the rivets off the shield. Oh, cheers, mate. I'm gonna have to knock off in a sec. I've overrun anyway, but. Um, Say it, what's that? Save it. I know what you meant. <laughs> <clears throat> Cheers, matey. So yeah, so like the whole thing the whole thing with the historicals is like if if I'd have put that shield with the rivets in and I'd, I'd accepted it and gone with it, um like people would lose their minds over it and it's it's ridiculous. But like stuff like that, you've got no no room for error for. And I was doing this, the scenery for the Baron's War, and honestly, we had we had conversations cropping up, which were like they just they blew my mind, if I'm honest, because we were talking about Dark Age buildings. Um, so I sculpted a whole Dark Age village for them, and people turned around and went, "Oh, that's not historically accurate." Like how the bloody hell do you know where you're there? Because like, you know, telling me the roof's wrong on it. It's like, how can you know the roof is wrong? It was thatched. There is literally no thatch 
that survives from the Dark Ages period. This is the 1400s. It's like, was that 700 years ago? 600, 700 years ago? Do you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> there is literally no physical evidence to say that what I've done is wrong. Um, there's photos and there's historical recreations and stuff like that, but they're all they're all other people's interpretations of what they thought it might have been at the time. So you even get those kind of arguments going on, and it's like you can't even really make that argument because it doesn't make any sense. But like I say, if you're willing to take on that kind of challenge, there is a massive market for historicals. And in fact, I would also say, if you're willing to take on that challenge, do it and run your own, run yourself like a Patreon doing it. Because if you find like a niche of uh, historical stuff that is not covered um, and it interests you enough that you want to do it yourself, then uh, you know, reap the rewards, man. Always, man. I say, John, make sure you're in the uh, Discord server. If you want to chat about anything anytime, don't wait till I'm on stream. You can just ping a message in there. I'm always happy for like a little chin wag, a little chat, offering some advice. I mean, I've made a shit ton of mistakes over my uh, my career, and I would rather tell you about them and share the experience so you can learn from them, rather than having to go through the headaches and do it yourself. Yeah, exactly. And this is the this is the thing. But they all they all know best. Do you know what I mean? And that's the this is the problem. These are the people you'll be dealing with. So you haven't really got room for much in a way of um, manoeuvring, unless you do. Um, what do you call it? Something that's more inspired by history. Right, that's as far as I'm going to be able to take him because I'm going to have to dash off now and go get the kids from school. So I'm going to, I'm going to tatter up all his clothes. I'm going to tear him apart. I'm going to. Is the wife phoning me, telling me to get my ass moving more than likely. Yeah, I have definitely got to get going because I'm going to be there at three o'clock. So. Right then, guys, it's been lovely speaking to you all. Thank you all for your time. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for keeping me company and for the chats and the chin wags. For Xander, I've done nothing but hydrate. I'm bursting for the loo. <laughs> I'm going to have to leg it to the toilet before I uh, go and pick the kids up. So, guys, have a fantastic day. Uh, I won't be around tomorrow on stream. Um, I may be on Friday. I'm not 100% certain yet. Monday, I think, will be my next stream, and I'll be doing a Nanolift special. So if you fancy a bit of cyberpunk action, <clears throat> I'm going to put an, a, a, a Facebook um, Facebook ad up, um, not an ad, a Facebook uh, event, just to kind of like queue it up so we can share that and get some uh, viewers on it. But I'll be doing that for the guys at Nanolift, so they've got a couple of boss creature STL files to share with uh, the backers. So tune in on Monday for some cyberpunk goodness, uh, and otherwise, in the meantime, I'll be around on Discord, so um, I'll speak to you guys then. Guys, I'm not going to be able to raid out today. I'm just going to uh, run because I'm going to be late for picking up the kids. <laughs> so, thank you all again, and I'll uh, catch up with you later. Right, later, taters. See you later. Bye.